for Play Observed by Barstool Sports and brought to you as always by our very good friends at Owens Mixers. We had a nice little Owens Transfusion Thursday this last Thursday uh, where we recorded a bunch of different interviews. We had Will Zalatoris for a full hour. He's obviously 24 years old. He's young. He popped up at the US Open last year at the Players' Championship and then big time at the Masters, finishing second. This is a very, I mean, I know we're a golf podcast. This is a very golf heavy interview I mean this guy was going through shot by shot you could tell he still was reliving he was still not over all of it um, as you as you would expect I mean he finished second one shot back at the Masters as a a first-time participant Um, but he goes through a lot of his the statistics that lead to his strategy um, where he's at with his game with his life what the Masters was like he just got engaged so it's a really really good interview we have Will Zalatoris for a full hour but but that was interviewed, that was filmed, recorded, whatever you want to say, on Transfusion Thursday, last Thursday. And I saw a lot of people this time of year, fellas, starting to get out there and starting to post their transfusion photos. It's a really good drink on the golf course. It's great to pull that out of your golf bag also, and you can bring it up. Maybe you get a little bit of vodka at the uh, halfway house, and then you bring it back to the cart. I did that uh, this weekend, and it got rave reviews from people all over the golf course they, they saw the branding they saw the, the transfusion logo they could it's almost like they saw it's almost like i was holding gold they're like holy mm. shit you have the transfusion i'm pouring it in it was a whole store it was a whole thing you know i was the transfusion guy at the golf course you so, were yeah, you were you were bringing it like frankie was bringing you were santa claus you were like well, that's uh, what owens really Mixers does good cocktail santa claus they turn you into this like mixologist like we've said that before it's super easy you don't have to know how much grapefruit how much grape juice to use how much club soda to use uh, how much vodka it's just all made for you you know it's perfect, perfect. it's a perfect drink made for you a song by jake owen that's uh, number Ooh, one that's i believe song. that is a good song really good song mm-hmm. yeah it's fantastic i saw uh, all of our guys you know they've been together like chase rice cole swindell and they're with jake and they've been kind of plugging the fact that that song is has been number one so that just made me think of it made for you but also the transfusion by owens made for you so you can get that you can nice. get a paloma with their little grapefruit line they got a lot of really 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 good uh mixes that you just pour in with your favorite liquor of choice it's that simple you become a mixologist you impress your friends you impress yourself maybe a girl maybe a guy whoever you want to impress you can just do it and if you just want to learn and have new drinks it's great for that too so big thanks to owens mixers but yeah will Zalatoris, great name really good guy very clearly into golf and what i mean by that is he was willing and able to go through shots, decisions. He goes through what his whole morning was like on the days when he was teeing off, you know, Saturday and Sunday, one of the last groups or the last group. Um, you know, what he did all morning, how he tried to kill the time. Guys, you know, traditionally try to stay up late if they have an early tee time so that they don't have to kill the whole morning. Like, we got into it with Zalatoris about the Masters, and it was, it was fucking awesome. Yeah, he's, he's the man. Um, I, I want to go back and listen because we did this on – thursday and i want to go back and listen to by the way i have a do you hear like how my voice is just a little bit like something going on i just had a vinaigrette salad and i feel like the vinaigrette uh balsamic vinaigrette dressing is like getting caught in my tongue and my i sound very um almost like fleming hmm. you know can you notice that uh frankie has a sty rigs he's been I, talking about it all day i got a sty in my no eye. i think i got it in no, a bunker but, but you guys are far enough away that i can't really see it's the type of thing where once I mention it, all you stare at is my style. It's crazy. I, I was teabagging the shit out of my eye last night. Um, right. Like, I agree. I don't think I would have noticed it, but he came into the office and didn't even say hello. First thing he said was like, I got a style on my eye. And now it's the only thing I can look at. That's what I, I always have at myself because, like, I know I'm my own worst critic. Yeah. So I'm immediately thinking about what everyone's thinking about me at all moments. And now you're thinking about the voice thing. Now I'm thinking about the voice thing. Right. So, yeah, I, we just uh, talked about this this morning, how I just talk about things that don't need to be said. Because I think, oh, my God, everyone hears my voice is so phlegmy. Oh, my God, I have to say something. Right. You know, they're like, Frankie, no one fucking cares. Yeah, right. I, I would say to... you're you're well known for being you, – you speak about things that don't need to be spoken about. And no about. one gives a fuck about it. They're just like, keep yeah. talking or just don't talk. Just fucking shut up. I will say I feel – I just did the thing where I thought if I leaned in closer, I'd be able to see. But it doesn't yeah. make you closer because you guys are just that it's far like, from uh, the screen. One time where I, was, I, was watching, I was watching a game with my friends and someone was standing in front of the, the camera. I guess it was like – in the actual on the actual tv right and they moved over to look around the person <laughs> doesn't work that way <laughs> like that just didn't work <laughs> camera staying where it is right you moving to the right didn't do anything that that may be possible in the future at some point <laughs> right, but it's be. not possible 3d now. tvs yeah you know virtual d- dimensions anyway i want to go back and listen because he said something about 
Um, he goes pretty deep into this is hitting the middle of the greens as opposed to going for the pin, um, especially on par fives and stuff like to try and reach the green in two, or just like hit the center, the fatty part of the green. And, you know, once in a while you make that bomb putt for an eagle, but, you know, you take your four and you walk away. Stop trying to go for these ridiculously hard pin placements um, because he would fi- he found when he went back at the analytics that he was actually scoring worse when he would go for pins, which is super interesting. to, to go Well, think, apply that yeah. to your own game. And I've heard you say on the golf course, why am I aiming at pins? So I did it this weekend. So we listened, we interviewed Zell Torres, and then I found myself on, like, the ninth hole of a golf course. I had just missed, like, eight greens in a row, pin high, because I'm going for like the right side of the green and I just tugged it a little bit and I was in a bunker like fucking perfect distance I hit it I struck it well but I just like didn't hit it like per, like right in the spot that I wanted to maybe a, a yard or two to the right and I was in a fucking bad spot as right. opposed to Zalatoris is like take that same swing just hit the center of the green make your two putts and go on with this with yourself you're just going to score better every single round if you just hit the middle yeah. of the green. yeah it's not as sexy it, yeah it's not as like rewarding maybe to like drop a ball once in a blue moon around a pin like a fucking dart like how often are we firing darts out there rarely right never. so just hit this i mean literally and never and yeah so it was it was interesting because he you know he said he started by looking at the stats of his par 5 scoring his par 5 scoring sucked relative to where it should be and he's looking at guys like Spieth and his par 5 scoring and I think he, you know he said Spieth misses on the fat part of the green so if you have a right pin he misses left because when you go for a par 5 even if you're those guys you miss the green all the time when you go for a par 5 but you're just whacking it up there and then you know your short game the rest of your game so good and he went through in detail and looked at the stats and was like Spieth misses 75% of the time on the fat side of the pin when he goes forward in a par five and his par five scoring really good. He's like, mine was like the opposite because he's trying to make eagle all the time. He's like, so literally all I had to change was just like aim to the fat part of the green, not the, you know, the short side of the green. And all of a sudden my par five scoring got so much better. So like it was this kind of shit for an hour straight with Zalatoris, which was fascinating because, you know, he kind of famously during his masters, it was his rookie appearance, you know, uh, really nobody, uh, one time has somebody really truly if you don't count like the 30s won the masters in their first attempt so for him to be second place one shot back um everyone's like how did he do that and his thing was that he had basically by using this statistical approach decade um this guy Fawcett, like he had learned core strategy for augusta national through research and numbers you know not needing to play it for 15 straight years and so him applying that and going through a lot of that was just – it was very different than the way that any of us have ever thought about anything golf-related ever. Dude, also the thing that I think will resonate with people the most is if you aim for the middle of the green and you do tug it or push it a little bit from that initial spot that you were aiming at, you end up like sometimes getting lucky and just hitting it right next to the pin. Right. He talked about how a couple of times where they're like, oh, what a great shot by Zal Torres. He's like, I fucking pushed that thing. 15 feet right of where I wanted it to go. And, yeah, it ended up by the pin, but, like, I was just trying to hit the middle of the green. Yeah, he talks about how some announcers will be like, oh, Zal Torres is so aggressive. So aggressive. And he's yeah. like, I made a mistake. Yeah. And it so worked out. That's, uh, <laughs> that's something we should all apply to our games, man. Like, God, I hit the ball so well on Sunday, and I just fucking was missing greens. And I'm like, I should just do what Zal Torres does. What am I, Frankie Borelli, who can't hit fucking anything, doing aiming at these back right pin locations? Just hit the center of the green. Even take a different club if you have to. Like if the if it's a huge green, it's a back pin placement, but you know you can hit, and usually and maybe that's like a a six, and you're gonna fucking hit a draw in. Take a seven, just hit the fatty part of the green. You right. know what I mean? Like I'm just gonna start doing shit like that. Dude, I will I say I'll just I had play better. Like my last round out on the tenth hole, I had a little like nine iron in from 142 or something, and it was a right pin tucked like right by this bunker, and I was like, I'm gonna aim about 20 feet left of it, and just and I just hit this like push draw that started right at it and just ended up right next to it but he's like what an unreal shot and i was just like thank god i didn't say out loud that i was aiming 20 feet left of it because that was just like zalator said it was just not where i was aiming but you buy yourself that cushion when you when i was aiming right at it i'd be in that bunker and that's a bogey or a double but instead aim a little bit middle of the green hit one right at it don't tell anybody and then you just claim that it was a perfect shot it really comes down to who do you think you are like aiming at pins. We all think we're better than we are when we're when we're standing over a ball staring. Especially when you hit a fairway. You're in that fairway. It's nice and it feels good. It's squishy. You got a nice shiny golf club in your hand. The ball's sitting up pretty. You see a green. It's unprotected right in front of you. There's bunkers maybe on the right and the left, but it's just fucking right there, man. And we're all like we're pin seeking. I just made a fucking eleven on the hole before, and I'm <laughs> pin seeking on hole ten. It's like what are we doing out here? So yeah, no, we need to just. 
that's the mental side of the game, to be honest. Yeah. That's just – it's all mental because the swing's going to be the same. It's just like where yeah, are you deciding the, pre-shot? It's like the course management and strategy to the game that you don't think about, right? Like these guys on tour too, they all hit the ball so well that you wonder, like how could one even actually beat the other one like any given week? Or how does somebody right. – and they talk about how Jack and Tiger are like the best – course man and Zal Torres brings them up is like they weren't necessarily using statistics they just kind of figured it out and knew but how they're referred to as like the best course management players of all time but we again dude when you're just trying to hit the ball inbounds like you don't think about course management like what do you mean I'm not managing anything like I'm trying to manage a keeping a ball in play so I can hit it again but but that little stuff and breaking it down in such like minuscule kind of compartments throughout the round can make a huge fucking difference. So hearing him talk about that for a while um, was cool because it was so unique to any way that we've ever thought about it. Um, I, so I got chirped th- this week because I pulled out a hybrid on like a par four with the wind kind of in our face because there was these hedges and a fucking railroad station to the right. And I like, yeah, I wanted to fucking play well. And everyone in the tee box is like, oh, Frankie's trying to go low today. I, I mean, I pull, everyone else has like a big stick and they're fucking trying to just hit your eyes. You're out there to play golf. And I took a hybrid. I felt like an asshole. <laughs> it's like the third hole of the day. I'm like, I'm hitting hybrid off the tee. Everyone's like, look at this guy. Look out, Frankie's. Look out for the course record. Frankie's taking a hybrid off one. Course management's back. And when you're just being smart. Super, super smart. Like, do you yeah, some days do you some days wish that someone would steal your driver? Uh, or like when the other day when you, you know, misplaced your seven iron. Yeah. I think I remember you saying, like, I almost wish it was my driver. Right. Because cause you just, like, wouldn't make that many mistakes. Right. You know, how often do you, like... When, when, when you want to – like, I just think of course management is you're hitting a club that you're just super – like, you're really confident in, and I don't know why that's, like, a pussy move. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to stripe not, this hybrid, like, I, just a little bit shorter than my drive, and it's going to go right down the middle. Why would I take a drive that's going to go onto the train tracks? Did you hit hybrid there? Yeah, and I actually pulled it, and I was in a bad spot. And they're like, if you would have taken driver, there's no <laughs> there's no damage up there. You just would have been fine. That's fine. I was worried yeah. you were going to put no, – you were going to pull driver. No, I didn't. Okay. No, I stuck to my guns. It's just smart. I don't – I mean, it's not, it's, I would say you're a pussy if you call that a pussy move. Like, that's right. just, that's like being, like, you're just a hardo if you're saying that to somebody. What are you talking about? Just hit a club right. that you want to hit to put it in a good spot. Like, we got the video coming out tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, YouTube channel. Go subscribe, thank you. Uh, from Sand Hollow. And I remember on the back nine, like, I was playing really well that day. And on the back nine, like, every hole I looked at just didn't, didn't look like it. There was a lot of room to miss. So I just hit three iron the whole back nine, basically. But it's like, why? Why would you bring in driver and bring in trouble or hit it out of play if you don't need to? Is that because you're a pussy? No, maybe you're just fucking smarter than other people in that in that moment. Dude, what we did in California this last week, ball and hole, was, has really changed my outlook on golf. Like, I hadn't played ball and hole that seriously in a long, long time. Like, usually when you get a gimme, it's like you were going to make it 90% of the time anyway. Maybe that once in a blue moon, you fucking, like, will rim it around the hole and you'll just miss it and everyone goes crazy. But fuck, man, like, I, I like whenever someone like picks up a ball now, I'm like, oh, I mean, like you weren't going to make that. Right. You, I've after watched what, us all just miss one and two footers. I mean, you guys may never give me a gimme putt ever again after watching me in California. So, I, I couldn't. You people will see it when the video comes out, but it's a train wreck. Dude, I fully when. So now I've become like kind of an asshole because guys like just don't even want to <laughs> hear about it anymore. We played on Sunday and um, I like to beat my one friend, Andrew. I just love beating him. And he's it's just very like we have a very good rivalry on the golf course. And we were giving each other somewhat of gimmies like through the day. And on 18, like he had like a one and a half foot putt to just tie me. We were both going to shoot like 85 or 86. And he legitimate. I just didn't say anything. And I just made him butt it. And he fucking missed. And I won. And I'm like fucking ball and hole, man. Like that is right. That's the difference right there. I just beat you today because you couldn't make that putt. And if you play a full round like that, you wouldn't believe how bad your score is. You would not believe how bad your score is. It is much, much worse. Oh. It just makes what the pros do that much more incredible. Like right. We all, everyone listening to this fucking does the, the pickup. You're playing in a match. You're playing with your buddies. There's a ball that's right on the – it's a foot and a half out, two feet out. You take it. You, you do your little scoop with your putter, and you put it in your pocket. But if you play and one – And then you post a 79 on your fucking gin. Like that's for the record, though, that's for the record, everybody should do that. Like right, For pace should. of play, for enjoyment of the game. Yes, like everybody 100%. Should yes. Right, they should. But, but I just know listeners are going to be like, well, that's not golf. Like, you don't put the fucking ball in your pocket. You, it's like, yes, you do. You, everyone fucking does that, and they should do that. If you play one round ball and hole, oh. it will change things between you and your friends. It will. About yeah, what and, putts you're going to give them. But, like, this is the way – like, the way that – 
that we are used to playing and how most people play is how they literally only play over in Scotland where the game was invented. Like when you go over there, they actually only, a lot of times they only give you match play scorecards. They don't even have stroke play on there. It's just match play scorecards because, and it has like next to the whole number, it has like the stroke, the match, it literally say like match play stroke so that you know where the strokes fall because everything is match play. Nobody in their right mind wants to be out there grinding, like fucking lining up the, everybody's ball for two and a half feet. Like who gives a fuck? Nobody like G4 has the hat. Like no one cares what you shot. So in reality, right. like unless you're some hardo that's going to be out like, like measuring your dick against everybody else's dick, guess what? Have a match with your friends. If you're out of the hole, pick your fucking ball up and it doesn't really matter that much so i think most people should play that way it gives you enormous respect for the pga tour pros like they can't just walk off a green until their ball goes in a hole and sometimes like that ernie ellis clip we kept kind of like referencing that when we were doing our ball and hole you know a couple days in the u.s open courses of like when he's seven putts the first hole at augusta to make a 10 you're like you know what i can see that happening because when you lose like that motor skill in those moments to just put the ball in the hole there's no way to get it back you're just like i can't roll the ball into the hole i can't you do it. just don't know what that feeling's like until it starts to happening to you and it happened to me a bunch of times at olympic and tory and you you know where you are you know where the hole is and you just you just know it's not going in i kept saying it felt like i ate really spicy wings when i was standing over the ball <laughs> like my my sinuses were clearing themselves out and I just could not get that ball in that hole. Heartburn of a 20-year homicide detective. For <laughs> real. And, again, people will see this when the video comes out. But it's just – it's it's a nightmare. But ball and hole is very tough. Dude, and then you look at a guy who fucking shoots a 65 out there on tour, and you're like, holy fuck, that's fucking ball and hole, man. That's you know what so I mean? impressive. It's just ridiculous how impressive that is. It's just ridiculous. It's uh, – I remember, like, I was – the first club, Granite Links Golf Club, which, we, which we've talked about, it's like semi-private, and they had a really good, like, join as a under 30-year-old right out of college. So I joined up there for a few years. Lurch was up there all the time. And they would do the club championship, obviously, like once a year. And it was the one time where, every, I mean, everything's got to go in the hole. It's the same kind of thing. And it was very funny how different people's scores were from, you know, their handicap and what they typically post with the boys every Saturday or Sunday to – club championship some of that's tournament golf but also it's like when the ball just has to go in the hole when it has to go in the hole you just add a couple strokes to your score every time like no matter what Dude, happens you're going to add a couple strokes when i touched down in california in my head i was like i'm like a 105 golfer that's like what i'm shooting now when i'm playing with frankie i'm around 105 pretty much every single time we play ball and hole it's a much different number it's just a much different and it's a much higher number it's yeah, scary it's, it's a hard um, game Folks should be getting out and using the Barstool Golf Time app, by the way. It is the best app to uh, book tee times. Worked very hard on this thing. It's our tee time app. It's what we want a tee time app to be. We're getting more reviews up there. We're allowing people to post their own reviews. We have a reward system coming out very soon. So the more tee times you book with it, the more that you use it, the more benefits you're going to get from discounted tee times, free tee times, merchandise, etc. So Barstool Golf Time, go download that puppy and use it right now. Right now. It's right a really now. good app. I mean, it's uh, review-based golf apps are the the way of the future when it comes to like knowing where you want to golf. Right? It's it's no more looking up online. You have to find the the website. You like sometimes it's it used to be a grind to see updated pictures and, and information about a golf course. You'd show up, the place would be dead, the greens would be ripped up. You'd be like, wow, the fucking picture on the website had a had a fountain, a water fountain, and like doves flying all over the place. This place looked incredible. Meanwhile, that was like 1985 when like the golf courses were booming, <laughs> and like you know the fucking stock market was through the roof, and they had a lot of money. And now it's fucking the place was like, I, that's happened to me before on Long Island. I'm like this place, like you saw a tumbleweed go across the fairway. I couldn't believe. I mean, it's just lies. It's like it's dating profiles. It's just a lie, right? It's like yeah, I, I, got I, showed up, I showed up and I found this is you know this is not who you are. That picture's from 20 years ago. You don't want to get catfish on the golf course and up to date reviews and pictures um, is the way to go because guys are and the more we use this, the more that you guys share this app and download it and use it, the more information you're going to get. We saw that with the pizza review app. In the beginning, it was very like one or two guys would review a pizza place. And, like, those were the only pizza places in town that had a review. And, like, they were like, all right, we got to go to that pizza place, even though they weren't the best. The more reviews that come on, the more you really start to see the winners rise to the top. It's like a true database. True database. It's real data. It's our fan base, and our fan base knows golf the best. So download it. Use it. Use the rewards that, that are going to be coming out. Um, it's a must-have app. 
Uh, shout out to listener Dave, who got his first ace over the weekend at Canoe Brook, the south course in Summit, New Jersey. 10 toll from 184 yards. He hit seven iron. Got Whoa. his own ace. Sent us a little email with this picture, which I love. Just like so jacked up. He's like, you know who would like this? The four play boys. I bet they would really, really like to see this picture. And he's correct. But yeah, 184 yards. He had a seven iron. That's a big seven iron. That is a huge seven iron. Weren't we going to do something once where we were going to like have a plaque or something? Or we were just going to announce maybe all the hole in ones? Maybe. We should stop getting emails about them. I don't. We were well, going to do something for hole in ones. ones. Maybe everyone stop. Has, has a. How many days go by in between hole in ones? Is there are there none? I'd say there's a. I'd say, with our listeners and how many people, would you say that there's a hole in one every week, in the four play crew? Right? Yeah, that's probably fair. I was gonna say yeah, every day, least. but there's no chance. I would almost say every day. You think there's a hole I mean, in one every day amongst the listeners of this podcast? Three hundred sixty five hole in ones a year. Yeah. I think I think maybe there is. <laughs> Riggs just went off that cliff. He had no idea. He was just like, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, I was, yeah. It's like I bet the numbers wise it might be, but reality it it isn't, right? Like I think right. there's more than 365 holes in one in a year from our listeners, but I bet you could find days or stretches where listeners. there's just none. Right? You th- yeah. There's there's bigger breaks than every day. I agree with that. Frank it's also tricky for everyone listening because they don't know how many people listen to our show. So we're right. – everyone's being a little coy well, with it this, right now. This is kind of funny. <laughs> this is kind of like well, – this is what we talk about at our desks. But I asked if there was a follower of mine that had murdered someone. Yeah. Do we think that I have a murderer following me? And then I said I probably have about 10. Right? Like, I mean – So you've got what? How many followers? I think 180,000 or something okay. like that, 186. Like, do we think that there's 10 people that follow me that have committed murder? Do you think there's one person that's committed murder? There, I, there <laughs> for sure, there's one person that has committed, that has taken, taken someone's life. My gut says 10 is too high. <sighs> but maybe that's just me being hopeful. Well, um, uh, I mean. Yeah, but no, uh, like. I'm not going to – I mean, I know he's – but I'm looking at O.J. Simpson's Twitter account right now. I mean, he follows he, 34 people. So, those 34 people right there, oof. I mean, they've got – instantly they've already got somebody locked up. <laughs> That's such a good point. That's a great point. I mean, like, I know it's only 34, but come on. Dude, I mean, that's one I could just see. I could just, like, see that right now. And I, I, and I want to let the listeners know that I don't want to know who you are. You know, I don't want to know the answer to this. Right. I don't. Because if you let me know who you are, then I, like that's a problem. It's then up to you now. That's a problem then. Yeah. Like I don't need to know. I don't need to know. So I uh, almost wish we would cut this. It's almost I don't one need of these murderers mur- like, reaching come- out to me, being like, "I don't need a murderer reaching out to me." Like, yeah, I follow you. <laughs> that's a that's a fucking problem, man. Yeah. That that's a slippery slope, dude. That's heavy. That's a fuck. Yeah, man. dude, I follow you, and I fucking killed someone for sure. I follow you. You're next. You just that's brought like, that. Holy you mean? Fuck. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ. You just no brought thanks. that on yourself. You just brought that fire to yourself. Oh, you as well, too, though. You know? You guys have more powers than do, me. I didn't. I didn't That's your it. hypothetical. You're, or it's yeah, your you're a part of the goddamn show. <laughs> Tweet at Riggs and Trent, too, if you follow that. I feel, no. re- I feel real nervous energy coming off Frankie right now. <laughs> like, he is, he's upset at himself that he brought this to the podcast. Because murder is no joke. No. Nope. You know? That no. is no fucking joke, man. That's also that's what are these, deal like, bad shit. Why are these murderers on Twitter? Shouldn't they just they should be in jail somewhere? I mean, right. True. Or, yeah. True. Or on like death True. row or something. It shouldn't There's be a just lot. On There's just a lot of questions like, yeah, if they've done it and they're still following you on Twitter, that means they're <laughs> free. <laughs> and that's a problem. What um like what percentage of murderers you think in the United States get caught? Like a huge percentage, right? It's like really hard to get well, away with murder. I also asked Trent this because I've I've been on a rewatching of Peaky Blinders kick, and best show like probably one of the best shows ever. If Very you think good. about just how how many good things happen, plot wise in each episode of of Peaky Blinders, it's astonishing. It should be mentioned more in people's top five. It just never slows down. It never slows down. Right. Always a, a main character is into something. Whatever. Really good show. 
but in the, in those days, in the 1930s or early 1920s, 1930s of England, you could fucking kill someone in a gang fight or whatever it was. Like you just go to the fucking pub, shoot the guy in the head, and like that was payback for killing his brother or his fucking auntie. And it's it, no one got caught. I mean, they, the police were paid off. The whole thing. I don't think you can commit murder like that anymore. I think that's the, the days of that are done. Surveillance cameras, I would say, most likely put a big dent in all of that. Right. And DNA yeah. testing. Like old yeah. school mafia and like the old, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Throwing people in rivers and shit. I just don't know that that's even possible anymore. Now, it used to be way easier to get away with it. But now I think for good, for the goodness of society, I think it Thank is God. tougher to get a to get away with murder in 2021. I really, especially like, I think guys like us, like it would, like we would just, we would just be the most caught people of all time. Like there's, 100%. we have no and then, chance. Well, you do have like, you do have like the Gilgo guy, Gilgo beach guy. They haven't caught him yet. There's bodies all around long Island. Oh really? Oh yeah. That was a couple years ago. Gilgo beach murder. <sighs> Not good. I know Frankie couldn't get away with it. Cause he would tell somebody. Just because of the st- like the sty and everything, he would just tell someone about it. I don't know if this is this conversation happening or the salad I just ate, but I gotta go poops, man. Okay. You know something's happening here. I just got the sweats. I'm freaking out, man. You really Before never you- know. No pun intended. What's gonna What's gonna come out of you, eh, Frankie? It's like it's a mur. Like is there, my murders followed me? Then it's like I gotta go poop. Then it's like I gotta stop. It's just you never know what you're gonna get. Never, never eat a salad and it just runs right through you. Of course. I mean, within minutes. Especially when. How does if- that happen? The first salad off of me deciding that I'm going to eat healthy after I've been eating like a garbage dump for a whole month, that salad is, is a quick reactor. Have you ever killed somebody? No. Okay. Promise. Yeah, because that would be one. You, I promise you that I did not kill anyone. Okay. That is a fact. I just want to make that clear. I'm also I killed Glenny, uh, Glenny Balls today about the Islanders Rangers. I'd like to kill Lurch, but... Uh, Sam Burns won the Valspar Championship <laughs> down at uh, Copperhead Course at Innisbrook. Uh, this guy's been really close. He's been, you know, kind of touted by a lot of folks as uh, a guy that's clearly going to win a good amount. He's got what it takes. He's been in the mix uh, at several big events, and he just got it done. He played well all week, and then you never know how somebody's going to react in the final round. Uh, it was really kind of a two-man race through 12 holes and then Keegan hit it in the water on the 13th. And at that point, Sam Burns just cleaned up, dominated, um, won very convincingly. And again, he's one of those, you know, when he's holding the trophy that the commentators, the, um, the analysts, the Brandles are all saying, you know, uh, don't expect this to be the only time you see him holding the trophy as somebody who's going to win a lot. Uh, so good to see, nice to see him break through. And uh, I think this guy is truly going to be a, a stud out there for a long time to come. Yeah, 24 years old, LSU boy. He's got a lot of promise ahead of him. Ben Mintz was very excited this morning when he came in. I was sitting at my desk. Yep. He was uh, – I think he might know Sam, um, but he was – our guy Ben Mintz was jacked up about the Sam Burns. Jacked this morning. up. No, he – yeah, he came in, and it was a very quiet office. Everyone was just sitting there. And he, up, he was just he's Sam the best. Burns. That's exact. And he was yelling at me, being like, "Can you believe that? <laughs> you I believe like, it?" I was like, "I'm excited. I'm not as excited as you are, but I'm excited because you're excited." But uh, yeah, no, I, it's tough to see Keegan go in the water. Obviously, he's been our guy for a long time. But uh, Sam Burns, yeah, he's. I think I think the analysts are right on that one. He's. This will not be the last time he's holding up a trophy. Imagine going out there, going 69, 69, 68, 65, and losing the tournament by four strokes, like Victor Hovland. How much better of a week is, is a guy supposed to have on PGA Tour? With all that pressure, ball in hole, we talk about all this <laughs> shit. 69, 69, 68, 65. 65 on Sunday. I mean, we've been talking Just a lot of fucking grinding out on the golf this course. Been a, he didn't even come close. This has been a common theme with guys like our guy Joel Damon winning. We just we talk about how hard it is to win on the PGA Tour. You can put up four scores in the 60s and still lose by four Low strokes. 60s. Right. 68, like, 65? Come on now. It's hard out there. You all... You also, like, you know, you just, like, Tony Finau, for example, right? If he, just four or five of those weeks, if just, like, one person just hadn't played a little bit better, I, if, the, if, if one person each one of those weeks just had made, like, two or three less birdies, right? Like, if two or three less of those 12-footers just rolled in, then Finau would have won, like, five tournaments in the last couple of years. But instead, it's so hard to win that he just can't fucking win and like you said like when you 
when you just announced those scores, Frankie, I was like, oh, that must be Sam Burns' scores because like he, that's just someone who wins, and he just didn't win. He posted those numbers and finished tied for third. He was never really had a chance on Sunday, and that's amazing because those are really good scores, and these guys are so fucking good. Like you can't even Monday qualify. Like if you sent, if you sent. You know, John Rahm out there today, he might not Monday qualify for any of these PJ Tour events. You got to shoot like 62, like a crazy person. And then to win these actual tournaments, when I mean, you go out to a course like that, the Copperhead course is impossible. It was firm, especially over the weekend. Balls were bouncing over greens, playing everything in the fucking hole. It was windy on Sunday. There's water all over the place, playing it from 70, however many, you know, 7,000, however many yards, and finishes 13 under par with scores like that. And he's just tied for third. That's it's amazing. criminal, man. It's just crazy. It really is astonishing how well you have to play to win these tournaments. It really, really is. This, this is a little off topic, but did anybody else get nervous a couple weeks ago when Finau and Cameron Champ were near the top of the leaderboard at the Zurich? Like, I don't – that's not the one I want Tony to win. Like, I, I don't ever want to root against Tony Finau, but I don't want it to be the two-man tournament. Like, because then we have to have the discussion that I guess we're going to have right now where it's like, yeah, he won, but – it was the Zurich, and before that, it was, you know, the Puerto Rico event. Like, I need him to just win a full-on, I don't want to say real PJ Tour event, but a real PJ Tour event by himself. Agreed. He has to earn it himself. Tony Finau needs to go out and win. It's an individual sport. Had he won, he didn't. Had he won as a team, it would have been a little tough. But it could have been like a nice little stepping stone for him to get the, you know, to get it out of the way and the floodgates open, and then he starts winning a lot. I wouldn't have hated that. But it wouldn't. Have, we wouldn't have been sitting here being like Tony Finau. He finally got that win. Especially if like, if it wasn't even him. It's like his partner Birdie's like seventeen and eighteen. I mean, I know it was all during shot. But like partner like hits one tight on like seventeen, and then like right. stuffs his second shot on eighteen. And like yeah, then you're kind of like, dude, did he? He didn't even win. He just was there for the other guy hitting six shots. Right. Like if if a champ had been burying putts, like the one thing that Finau can't seem to do in the moments where he needs to do them. Then we're all just like, well, he just he was the replacement and he, he carried you through it. So I'm not I don't want to say I'm glad Tony Finau didn't win that tournament, but I think it it saved a lot of conversation around what's next for Tony. Um, I got to give credit to Bryson DeChambeau's uh, Twitter account, which tweeted out a picture of Sam Burns and wrote a dream come true. Thank you to my incredible support team for helping me get to this point. Looking forward to what's to come. Tagging Callaway, Adidas, MasterCard, and his other sponsors that are clearly Sam Burns sponsors. Um, you do see stuff like this that occurs, but clearly just the same, whether it's PR or social media agency, is representing both of these guys. And the person just tweeted the wrong tweet from Bryson's account. And it was very funny when this came across. It's brutal, man. I mean, that's why Barstool has, like, you know, we're our own lane because we run our own Twitter accounts and we speak from the mind and yeah, you know, we get ourselves in trouble sometimes because we say stupid shit because the mic's always on and we're always tweeting stuff, but like, you know, it's coming from us. And the, the thing that I hate about like other fucking Twitter eggs and all these people like Jeff Shackelford's and all these like buttoned up people. And even these athletes that are just like, like they're paying someone to tweet for them because they don't like know how to have the voice that everyone's going to like and love. And it's like, what are you doing, dude? Like, how are you letting someone log into your account to write that tweet? Like, I mean, it just drives me crazy that like, he can't just be a real person, take control of his own life, his own brand, his own image. And like his own Twitter account can't be him now. Now every tweet is just like, we just don't think it's Bryson. I will say there is a side to me that agrees with them. Like if I were that good at the game of golf, I would just say, I'm going to handle the golf. Like, I'm going to do really well at this. Like, we're saying this about social media because we are somewhat good at being on social media. Like, we've just yeah. grown up. This is our job. We know what we're doing. We've watched other people do it enough where we're like, we sort of know what we're doing. But if I were a Bryson or, or a Sam Burns, I think there might be a part of me that would say, I'm going to kick ass on the golf course. You guys make sure all my sponsors are happy with the social media, uh, you know, things that I need to put out. So I, I actually sort of understand. Like, I don't know if I would run my own Twitter account if I was – Bryson DeChambeau. 
It's yeah, but then like, I would almost like say like then are. I would like prefer they don't even have one or they right. don't update one, right? Like they don't. He doesn't need to tweet out congrats, Sam Burt. Like he they, and he didn't even. He was so. I just think like we're we're not fucking idiots. The people that follow us aren't idiots. They can just sense if somebody's is really them or really isn't. And so it would be better to just not even have a presence. Like yeah, have an account, sure, and like post some sponsored stuff here and there that like you're part of because you're clearly in the sponsored uh, aspects of it and the videos that are shot. But like fake running one is worse than just not running one really at all. I guess what I mean is it's just sad that like the world we live in requires like a social media manager to take over an account and like write the correct way and tag the right people because like guys can't do it on their own and have like the good enough personality. Like a guy like Max Holm is not letting someone log into his Twitter and tweet about it. he's gonna do it his own way with his own voice his own picture that he's gonna add you know what i mean like that's who max Homa is he's really good at it and he's very transparent like I, you know what i mean it's just very yes. different and it's very just like stuck up douchey to just be like i don't know it's just different i don't know I you just know who you know who had the best Bryson just throws me off for sure you know who had the best tweet coming out of the weekend dustin johnson what did he say he yeah. said thank you at vault valspar champ for the great event period and then just a picture of him and his caddy Amazing. King. Like, he's just... See? Like... That one I That's enjoyed. something... I would, I would believe that Dustin right. ch- uh, tweeted that. I don't think he did, but, like, that's just him. That's someone that knows him that's running that account. Right. That's someone who's like, here's what he would say, and it's very little words. He's just like, thanks to the tournament. Great weekend. It'll be, it'll be fun to watch how the player impact program, PIP, kind of, you know, leads people to uh, doing different things as... As it progresses, where that $40 million goes, who tries different ways to get their their fingers on it. But I love that tweet from TJ. Did not obviously like the one from Bryce. I think it was deleted in like less than five seconds. I saw somebody who who has Bryce and notifications on that got that, and I think nobody else saw it. So um, so it is what it is, social media. It's where we live. It's not where everybody else lives. But that kind of stuff's very transparent, very annoying. Um, speaking of transparent, I, I got to be honest, I was never really – a huge cigar guy only recently or only maybe probably up until this last weekend, I'd maybe had seven cigars in my life, like single digit cigars, usually an occasion thing. And that's pretty much it. But like a very special occasion, a graduation or a a certain trip or something like that. Um, Macanudo cigars came on as a uh, sponsor for the Barstool Classic. So I have this really sweet case that Frankie actually Instagrammed and tweeted about this past weekend, um, which is amazing. This thing's awesome. But uh, I had a little cigar for a bit. I was doing Thursday night during the NFL draft show, and it was so delicious and enjoyable that I finished the whole cigar Thursday night, and then when I played again on Saturday with a few friends, I brought my Macanudos, and I fired these things up. Macanudo is the best-selling handmade cigar in the United States, and our golf course experience with these Macanudo cigars, fellas, has elevated my golfing experience more than I ever could have imagined. It's a really good cigar. It's um, they have the white, the and and the re- is it the red wrapper? The orange. The orange, orange is fantastic. Yep, I was having the white yesterday, and it was just it, it adds to the it just adds to the um, experience like you wouldn't believe. You you are living when you're walking down a fairway, sucking on a Macanudo. You just you look like you're in the right spot. You look like you're, 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 you're the guy. You know what I mean? Like, people look at you like, that's that guy. You, you know what I love about a golf course cigar? There's a lot of things, a Macanudo specifically, where when you're about to hit a shot, you have a couple of choices. One, you can keep it in your mouth, which looks cool. Which is really if hard. If someone's taking a picture, it is difficult, but if you can get it down and someone takes a picture of you, you're the coolest guy. But I also love the throwdown, yeah. where you're going you're gonna to hit and you just throw it off to the side. So you can do that. And then the other thing is you can put it on a tee. Ooh. So you put the tee in the ground. And you put the part, you know, that you're probably going to suck on, I would assume. Or maybe the lit part so it doesn't get whatever. But you put one of the, Or maybe you put both on a tee. I'd say the lit part up. Right. So you're putting them on right, a tee. Right. So you don't, burn do the, you don't want to burn the grass, probably. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I guess so. I was thinking more of just like you don't want the, 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 the lighting part to, be, to go out because then you have to relight it. I have to learn a little bit more. We've taken a, t- we've taken a, a class in Macanudos, essentially, where they taught us how to light it, how to smoke it, how to have fun with it. And I just like I, I need to actually physically do it. I can't wait to get to a Barso Classic to actually see them at the um, station where they, 
they light the cigars with you and they're going to teach you about the cigars. But like yesterday I had it and I just felt like I wasn't as perfect uh, around a circle. I maybe lit the bottom a little bit too much. The top was not as lit and I couldn't really play with it in like I, I'm, I need to learn how to smoke it better. I need to look better because like I was breathing in. I'm fucking like huffing and puffing, taking also, a swing. Then you're just like coughing. It's also probably reps. You it's just, reps. It's reps. You, you got, just keep doing it. You go out there, play golf, you fl- fire up a Macanudo and you'll learn. I would say for that travel case that I, I put it up on my Instagram story and so many people went absolutely nuts. I'd say keep an eye out for a nice little travel case um, for for cigars in the near future, maybe with some Barstool branding on it. Those because I, nice. I, I think that that travel case needs to be inside every single person's fucking golf bag. It is the coolest thing and it's a showstopper. And I think we're going to put one out. Uh, the Macanudo Inspirado, they got the Inspirado White, the Inspirado Orange, as Frankie was talking about earlier. You can enter and win a limited edition branded golf set in Humidor for your Macanudo Inspirado smokes at macanudo.com slash barstool. you got to be 21 plus only for entry, but macanudo.com slash barstool. Frankie was just talking about how cool a lot of this stuff is and that you need when you're out there and you're smoking cigars and you're having a Macanudo when you're being the cool guy on the golf course or girl. Um, do yourself a favor. Go to macanudo.com slash Barstool, you can enter and win a limited edition branded golf set and humidor for your Macanudo Inspirado Smokes. All right, folks, next up we have Will Zalatoris, who was a, uh, a bit of a heartthrob, a bit of a, uh, you know, he was a showstopper, if you will, at the Masters Tournament, coming in second place, giving it a run, not backing down, giving Hideki Matsuyama all he had. And, uh, and we talk all about that and much more on this show. All right, folks, we're joined by um, a very special guest. He's all over the news the last three, four weeks in the world of golf. He just got engaged, I believe, last week, which we already congratulated him on, but I'm sure we'll get into that. Finished second at the Masters, uh, tied for sixth at the U.S. Open last fall. So he's been kind of – he's got a great look to him, too. He's got a very unique look. Adam Sandler's chiming in, so he's been all over the place. Will Zalatoris, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me, dude. Looking forward to it. So um, let's start with getting engaged. Uh, I, I'm curious about nerve levels, right? Everybody talks about nerve levels in golf. Were you more nervous at all Masters Week or in kind of the hours, days leading up to your proposal? Uh, I was definitely more mentally out of it, I would say, probably in the week leading up to the proposal. Um, it was kind of... It, but we, it probably took about six to eight weeks to plan it all. And I had thought that I was going to do it later in the year. And I'd gotten the ring a few months ago. And I was just like, I can't hold on to this thing for that long. I got to I gotta do it sooner than later. This thing's going to be eating at me. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think uh, nerve levels are definitely comparable. That's for sure. But a few of my buddies had said that when you get down on one knee to – know what you're going to say and it was just like you know scatterbrain for what felt like eight minutes but i'm sure it was like <laughs> how'd you seconds. end up doing it what'd you what'd you plan some special how'd you do it yeah. um we, she went to grad school at ut so we did it down in austin and uh, surprised her with a few of her friends so it was a it was a fun weekend i, I kind of needed that you know because we with covid and everything it was kind of the first time we were able to get back together hell yeah um, so I, you know, I had to, I was best man at my brother's wedding and I remember I had to hold the ring for like, you know, five minutes or something before I find out. And the whole time I just said to him and to Maggie, as well, I was like, I don't like, this is, are you sure you want me to hold this ring? <laughs> Cause I could fuck this whole wedding up right now. So I, I can imagine you thinking you're going to have it for months. Like that's yeah. crazy. You just got to get rid of that thing. Yeah. I, I thought I was going to have it for probably i guess it would have been six or seven months and then all of a sudden i was like no i could do it this time and then i just progressively kept moving it closer and closer so and you've been and you've pocket. been on a roll you've been on a roll after master's week you like might as well do it now right yeah i i mean i was uh i've been thinking about it for yeah i mean i guess I, i've been working on that whole weekend for a while so it was fun we've it's been a it's been a good year yeah, like if there was ever a time that she wasn't going to say no, it was when you're, I mean, you're striking while the iron's hot. You're just coming off a, a great week at the Masters. Well, the other part too is, you know, she would, she, we've known each I guess we've been together for almost five years, but um, 
she came to Monday qualifiers. I mean, she was there Monday qualifier in Evansville, Indiana. And, you know, we're, I get done at Augusta walking off 18 and we're talking about, you know, we were joking about it. It's like, you know, get a standing ovation walking off 18 green at Augusta. It's like you dream about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then she's up there with me and she said, you know, well, I guess this kind of beats Evansville. I mean, no offense to Evansville, Indiana, but, you know, she's been there through it all with me. So it's been, uh, it's been fun. It's been really cool to have her there throughout That's all of awesome. this. Well, you, you gave us a little peek into that. Like, I mean, talk to us about, like, did you expect to be getting that standing ovation at Augusta National when you were in Evansville? Like, is this something that you knew that was going to happen? No, I mean, I, I didn't even, you know, when I made the putt, I, Corey still had, or Corey Connor still had the putt out. And I, the, you see it on TV, but it's not like I, – I honestly didn't really know what to do. That was the thing that was kind of funny about it is because it's like I make the putt, kind of give a little wave, people keep going. And I'm like, well, Corey still has to putt. And I'm like, they kept going again, and I was like, oh, God. And then Corey made a nice putt for birdie. And as I'm walking up or walking up to the back of the green, you know, everyone's like looking over at me and, you know, way to go, Will, and whatnot. And it was just kind of like a – you know, I didn't, re I actually, I didn't appreciate what I did and really until probably the last week or so. Um, I did a really good job of getting in my own world, you know, turn, turn my phone off, didn't watch any golf channel, didn't watch any coverage. Um, and I think that was kind of a good lesson learned, but my whole point of that was, it was like, even on 18, you know, give my caddy a hug. And I was like, man, that was a fun week. Um, you know, bummer. We came up short, and, but that whole, moment of everyone you know standing up and you know congratulating me but also just because i was the underdog and gave it a good run i thought was i mean i'll never forget that yeah i was i you know it almost feels like you have to not be able to appreciate it in the moment because if you truly did then you probably wouldn't be able to perform the way that you needed to perform right like if you're all of us if we're thinking over a putt like okay if this is the biggest putt we could have, right? If it's for to win the match or to go to Pinehurst in our little tournament that we do, if you're thinking about that, well, you're not going to make the putt. So if you're thinking like, man, this Augusta thing is just so awesome and you're really truly appreciating it the entire time, then you probably don't play as well as you did. Yeah, I mean, I think on – so this is kind of a funny part to the to Augusta was or that week was I played 13 terrible all week. I birdied the first day. I think I made a bad par the second day. Then – for some reason, that lower section was just so slow. I couldn't figure out what it was, but the back right portion, it slopes hard back to front, so everything's really quick, but everything on the front section, because I had two pins up in that front corner, it was just so slow, and I just could not get the ball to the hole. And so I ended up hitting it to like 60 feet, and Corey was like 70 feet, and right on my line, I'm like, perfect, I'm going to get a good read. And he left it. I'm not kidding. It was like 35 feet short. And, <laughs> and we had the rain, but I'm like, he literally was 10 feet in front of me. And I was like, man, man. I'm like, I got no idea now. I was like, I'm looking forward to seeing the read. And so, like, I knew that it was slow, and I left 10 feet short, hit a nice 10-footer, but missed it. And from that point on, I was just so deflated because it was like 13 is always the point where guys – you know, it's make or break, Phil yeah. out of the trees, Jordan out of the trees, you know, just there's so many great shots on 13, but that's like the turning point, like 14, you can maybe catch a birdie in there, 15, you can maybe make a three or a four. And all of a sudden it's like, boom, you know, that's how you see those guys that are five shots out of it. They're right back in it. And I knew I needed to get something going there. And I kind of like 14, 15, 16 was just kind of like, just so deflating because it was like you know boging 12 uh three putt par on 13 and it was just kind of like you know lollygagging a little bit but i mean it still was still had a bunch of good looks i mean i almost made the ones on 14 16 i made birdie on 15 but um i kind of got I kicked back into gear because i saw hideki on 15 when i was walking up 17 hit it in the back water and it kind of i mean i was joking with my caddy i was like this is sunday at augusta on the back nine i feel like my heart rate's at like 65 right now just because it's it's just like you're so up for so long and then all of a sudden you know you think you've got a chance to win got a chance to win and then you just feel like you're out of it and just feels like all these just feels so deflating and 
um once i saw his ball in the water i was like eh, i mean you know this, this isn't <laughs> over and so i made birdie on 17 and i just, I just hit a bad tee shot on 18 i mean i'd, I'd hit that tee shot so good all week and i was just the one bad one but um i knew i was like there's a backdoor chance like i gotta make par and so it was just you know free run from here but yeah it's just it's so funny to look back on it like you said like i wasn't really able to i appreciated it r basically for the first 65 holes of the tournament and just thought about the history and like enjoyed every piece of it and then all of a sudden it's like i finally don't have a chance to win and i'm like oh man and then all of a sudden it's like you know my caddies tell me like hey we got to get to the range like you got 20 minutes you never know what's going to happen so it, it just was such a weird ride but Dude, it's, you, uh, you know the thing that I, when we're watching, the Masters is the best week for everyone involved, right? Watching, playing, it's just the best week in the world. But when we're sitting there, we can't imagine that you guys are out there performing under that stress, that level. It is the, the Masters. It is Augusta National. Do you, is it just experience? Like, we've talked to, like, the greats. But like, like, I feel like we've heard from, like, Nick Faldos and all these people that have done it for years upon years. You're so new to this. What Was there, like, a moment where you're like, oh, yeah, I don't see the TVs anymore. I don't. I'm not like nervous about that stuff. I'm just playing golf. Like, do you remember like physically being in a moment where you're like, I can do this? Was it like a practice round? Was it the first, was it Thursday? Like, I, like what is it? Cause I've always wondered that. How do you get uh, over it? I think it's, you know, you get in your own world for one, you know, I'm not watching golf channel, not watching any coverage. Um, I did watch coverage before some of the rounds uh, just to see how some holes are playing, but you know, it's like I had never been in the final group on the PJ Tour period. And right. Saturday of Augusta, I'm in the final group with Justin Rose. And, you know, that's new territory. But we're still all trying to do the same thing. I mean, you know, even the great and even great players have, you know, messed up weekends at a major. I mean, Tiger is the exception by far. But, I mean, you know, it's like if I go out and shoot 78 on Saturday – well, you know, he's inexperienced, you know, it's kind of expected, whatever. If I go out and shoot 70 or whatever, 71, whatever I shot, and you're like, well, wow, you know, it's, you know, it's pretty respectable. And so if you kind of put things, you know, to terms a little bit, like I was actually more nervous leading up to the round on Saturday than I was on the first tee. Wow. Um, just the waiting around and thinking it through and, you know, watching some guys play some holes and, you know, I know the rain's coming in. Like, is it going to be one of those days where it's going to be blowing 20 and raining and it's just going to be an absolute beast? And, you know, I, and so it's just kind of like, you know, I got on the first tee and I piped one into the right bunker, which is like auto five. <laughs> and I ended up catching the lip and knocked it over to like 12 feet and I made it for par and immediately I'm settled into my round. Um, but I just, I think just, you know, I always loved as a kid watching the coverage and seeing the live from the masters and Rich Lerner doing his essays and, you know, these dramatic pieces on people. And then it's like, I go, you know, you're out there playing and you're like, this is the same thing I've been doing all year. It's just a really cool golf course with a lot of history. And, you know, it's, it's hard. I, I, I'm trying to minimize it, but at the same time, it's like, you have to appreciate it. Yeah. The, uh, I am amazed I'm happy you brought up the wait time because when you are in the last group or even one of the last groups, when you're teeing off at two something, like even us mm -hmm. as weekend hacks, if our tee time is not till two something, like our whole morning is the same. We clean our clubs 10 times. We go through five different outfit choices. Like you eat three different meals and then you're worried, did I eat too much? Might I have to go to the bathroom on the court? Like we don't know what to do. So now you're like in contention of the masters. Like how did you, I know you mentioned a little bit of coverage. Like how many meals did you eat? Were you trying to like, you know schedule out strategically when to eat like what was that from 7 or 8 a.m until 2 2 30 p.m like what did you do yeah i mean so saturday was was interesting because i had gotten up early which is pretty rare for a late tea time you know a lot of guys try to stay up late and wake up late to try to just kill the morning um i got you know i had a full breakfast that morning um I was cracking up laughing because um, I think someone, I think I might have said something like, you know, someone asked, you know, what'd you do this morning? I'm like, well, I made breakfast and 
made my mom an egg and they're like, Oh my God, he's in a contention at the masters He's making his mom eggs. I'm like, <laughs> who cares? Like, you know, it's like, I was just like, I was, I saw some article about that and I'm like, that's incredible. But, breaking news. <laughs> Every, yeah, sunny breaking side news, up. Yeah. Will makes an egg for his mom. What a great, great guy. Um, that's a, that's a lesson but, in itself. When you, when you start to get in contention, anything you do becomes a headline. That's oh, I know. stunning. Well, and so, I mean, I, but I just kind of like, had breakfast i think we watched some uh i think i watched like a dallas stars rerun from the night before because i missed the game um and then i actually went out to the golf course just had some lunch and i was ready to go but sunday was more the interesting one because we didn't eat dinner till like 10 15 because of the rain delay um so that was the one where i slept in super late so it made sunday you know i had breakfast and then all of a sudden it was like man you're got to get you know warmed up and ready to go and go have some lunch and so yeah that was definitely that was the harder of the two I thought I thought Saturday was was tough waiting around but Sunday was all of a sudden it's like okay you've been up you didn't go to bed till like 12 30 1 o'clock you didn't eat till late you know you've got to be exhausted so but I handled it fine and obviously when you're running on that much adrenaline I mean you could stab me in the side and I probably won't even feel it. So talk to me about now the back nine and just kind of even out there in general, trying to follow along with the leaderboards because Augusta is very unique. There's no video boards. They mm-hmm. do it old school. You know, they put them up and there's only so many out there. So like, you know, are you strategically when you, when you come down 11, when you, you know, after 13 where there's that board, like how like talk about where the leaderboards are and how you, you know, as someone who is in contention all weekend, we're trying to follow along. Were you following along? Are you somebody that's a scoreboard watcher? How does that, how does that work at Augusta? Yeah. I mean, I'm absolutely a scoreboard watcher. Um, you know, coming out of the gates and birding one and two and then Hideki bogeying one. So immediately his four shot lead goes to one. Um, that was, was kind of like a big time. Like we're in this, you know, that I'm settled in, you know, let's go earn it. Um, you know, it's kind of funny how the front nine went for me because it's like you birdie one and two, hit a bad wedge on three, and, you know, make a nice two putt on four. And then the chip on five was honestly, in a weird way, was like the stretch of where things started to really I kind of kick things into gear because I hit a terrible three wood off the tee and had like 250 in. And those two, those two bunkers on the left, like you're just laying up. Like it's honestly, it's a very bizarre sh- whole strategy wise because it's like, yeah, you can hit in the bunkers and lay something up, but it's like, you basically have to treat them like hazard. Like you're not getting there in two. It doesn't matter if you have a 50 mile an hour downwind behind you, like you just can't get there. And so I decided to lay up every day and the pin on Sunday is always over the knob on the front. And there's a crest on the front where it kind of goes both ways. So if I hit this chip, like, you know, if I don't hit it hard enough, it's going to come straight back down on my feet. And I'm going to have a brutal two or two putt from there. If I barely push it, it's going to trickle 45 feet off to the left. If I go left, it's going to be 30 feet to the left. And it's like everyone, whenever you see it, they just gun it and it goes straight over the hill. And mm-hmm. I hit this chip just absolutely perfectly. And I, I thought I was going in the entire way, but that was one where it's like, you're going to make five and all of a sudden you make four. I make a nice two putt on, on, uh, six. And, you know, from there it felt like it was off to the races. It was like, I just kept, you know, felt like I kept making putts and making putts and, um, just made a stupid mental error on 10, but that's where, when I'm on, I see Hideki at 13 and I think I was at eight. I think I was at eight and that's where it's like, you've got to make some ground on 13, 14, 15. Like you've got to make at least birdie on 13, birdie 14, have to birdie 15 just to put some pressure on them. And, you know, I, you know, 10, 11, 12, you play the one over, I'm really not going to be that disappointed. And I played him in two and it's just kind of like, whatever, you've got some holes to make up for it. And, you know, I, I had mentioned this before. It's like, you've seen enough coverage the years where guys, at 415, you've got Hideki at 13 and me at 8. At 430, Hideki's at 12 and I'm at 10. Or You know what I mean? It's like all of yep. a sudden, 
in a 45 minute span, there's, there was only, you know, there's a five shot lead. And then the next thing you know, there's four guys that are, uh, you know, tied for the lead. And so I knew that, that just anything could happen, but and after playing 10, 11, 12 and two over and then parring 13, that's where I knew it's like, you got to make some serious hay coming in here. It's uh, it's really interesting to hear it from you, especially, you know, when you mentioned like after the, you know, the second hole, when you see you've made, you've made a birdie, like Hideki makes bogey, all of a sudden the, the, the lead went from four to one. Cause like, that's exactly what we're thinking and exactly how, except you're like the guy, you're the guy on the leaderboard <laughs> yeah. thinking the same thing. It's, it's, it's like the same, it's the exact same trajectory and, and thought process except you're the one actually out there doing it. So it's cool to know that while we're following leaderboards, like you're doing the same shit. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing is like, it's not like I'm changing any strategy. I mean, you know, granted if all of a sudden I've got a, you know, if I had a five shot lead, it's, I mean, I'm looking so far right on 16, it's a joke, but, <laughs> um, but you know, it, it was just seeing how everything was playing out because, you know, there's, well, there was like four or five guys that were tied for second. Um, and I was a couple groups ahead of them, and I had a chance actually on Saturday night on 18 to make birdie to be in the final group. Um, but, you know, throughout Sunday, like, it's it just your strategy doesn't change. Like, if, you know, once I got the five or six back, that's where it's like, okay, maybe we start getting a little bit more aggressive because it's like, you know, if you finish second, at least I thought at the time, no, I mean, everyone's gonna be like, Hey, great tournament. You finish sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th. Everyone's gonna be like, Hey, great tournament. Like you're here to go win a green jacket. Like you need to go earn this. And, um, yeah, I just, I didn't, if anything, it's like, once you get to that point, it's like, you don't change your strategy, but it's like, if I mess up and mess up, like, let's just go have some fun here. And my caddy and I joked about it. We said, you know, the old military line of weapons free boys. I mean, you know, we're not leaving anything behind. This okay. is it. Right. TaylorMade, our landing page, is live. We are obviously TaylorMade athletes. We use the Sim 2s. We use their irons. We use their golf balls. That was really not maybe talked about enough last time when we were when I was obviously trying to highlight the parts of the game that I was actually doing well last week, which was chipping and putting. And the main reason that I'm able to get the ball up and down a lot is because I'm rocking um, the tailor made, the TP5, and my high toe wedges, and I'm able to get up and down a lot. It saves me a lot of strokes, which I love. But uh, our, our landing page, where you go to tailor made, uh, barstoolsports.com slash tailor made, we have our funny pictures on there, but it's live. You can go check it out. And tailor made's the best, isn't it, fellas? It's the best. The balls, the clubs. I mean, the, seven, the P790s couldn't be better fit for my game. I'm hitting irons like I've never hit them before. The, the Sim 2 driver is a cheat code. Um, you like the tour response balls. The tour response balls are just as good as any ball you're going to find. I mean, and then I say that because I, I fucking play them all the time. And then I got my hands on a TP5. Like, I just reached into my bag and I had a TP5. Yeah. And that's a fantastic golf ball. I mean, that's just a fucking real deal golf ball. Um, but tour response for that price and that, like, that um, category it's in, right, the more affordable golf ball. I think it's the best one in that level. I think people said, like, it took the old version of the other high-end company's ball, basically, all that technology, and put it into that. So, basically, a couple of years ago, when you were paying the high price for that other company's ball, that's basically a tour response ball now, and you're getting it for half the price. So, it's a really cool – like, th I'm, I'm talking quality um, when, the, when, they, when they say that. Yeah. So, it's really fucking – it's a really good ball of tour response. Uh, there's a reason that like the best players in the world are using TaylorMade. That Dustin Johnson, uh, who is the best player in the world, he rocks TaylorMade. He puts the driver of the Sim 2 right in play. You saw it as soon as it was announced that that was actually a thing that exists because it's that good. So do yourself a favor. Go to our page. Check out our action. It is barstoolsports.com slash TaylorMade. Uh, I want to I hear a little bit about the kind of the um, – decade and Scott Fawcett and the stats behind kind of your strategy. I believe, you know, he posted a text where you said you've given me, I think like 25 years of experience in five yeah. days. Talk about sort of the approach, because from my understanding, you know, it's, it's basically using hardcore stats over decades to, I guess, determine or help or assist or consult on core strategy and strategy, you know, out there. So talk about how you've implemented this and how it's helped you. 
Yeah, so that text message was from 2014 when I won the Texas State AM Caddy for me then. Um, you know, so like here's the basic premise that it's really helped me with is tour average from 100 yards in the fairway is 2.8. So you drop a ball in the middle of the fairway, a, a tour average player, it's going to take you 2.8 shots to hold it from there. So if you're to hit a shot onto a green where you're going to average 1.8, that, that's 16 feet. So roughly 5%. So if you think about it, if you've got a pin that's tucked three or four off of an edge, you should be aiming a yard or two away from that edge more towards the middle of the green. And the reality is like all of the really great players and all, all timers, they did it anyways. They, what they do, you know, like they might not know the statistics, but they just know, Hey, I've got a seven iron. This pin's four off the left. I should aim, you know, a couple of paces to the right of this flag. And what he's done is he's quantified strategy and it's there's little things you know now that i've picked up on that have helped me a lot where and this is the prime example was my first year on corn ferry my par five stats were absolutely abysmal and for courses where you got to shoot 25 to 28 under par to go on a golf tournament and not take advantage of par fives i mean good luck and, and you're a long hitter. You hit it pretty far. Yeah. And so what we had found was that I had been short siding myself on par fives more often on approaches than I was from on par fours and par threes. So if you're to take the same yardage bucket, if you will, from let's say 175 to 250, I was leaving myself short sided bunker shots or short sided chips out of the rough way more often on par fives. And so we figured out that Part of it was I'm trying to carve something in there and hit something tight and make three and be the hero. When in reality, it's like, dude, just knock on the green to 40 feet, two putt. Maybe the one goes in, you know, the two out of 100 times. And, you know, now all of a sudden your scoring average goes down. And so I kind of made a point last year that on par fives, it's like, you know, don't carve something in there, dumbass. Like hit something in the middle of the green, take your four, move on. And so, you know, the funny part was the first few months I did it from like January and then we had the break, but like January through June, I had like, just like a stupid amount of Eagles just because I was all of a sudden hitting a shot that I barely pushed and it ends up going to like 10 feet and yeah, right. I made them there. Thank you. <laughs> right. But, um, but, um, that, yeah, that's kind of, that's that's the beef I have some of these announcers. Like, oh, what an aggressive shot from Zalatoris. I'm like, yeah, I pushed it 35 feet. It's a great shot. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, see, I, I find that so fascinating because a lot of, you know, we'll go back and watch Tiger Tiger rounds, right, just from majors. And, and I'm always amazed at how unspectacular a lot of them are where oh, yeah. he, he, right, and like, yeah, he has the moments that we go crazy for, but he's so – Patient and a lot of like you're saying like on a, on a par five where it's like oh Tiger's got 247 like he could he could hit this sick cut two iron in there or whatever now maybe like a five iron for you guys but and and he just dumps one in a left bunker and you're kind of like all right but then he's got a sick sand game and he gets up and down every time when you add it up all of a sudden like man I didn't watch Tiger play Unreal Golf for the last four days but guess what he's got a one shot lead and now he's better under pressure than everybody else and he wins or even like when I when you watch Tom Brady a lot of Tom Brady's you know, big games for the first half, I feel like you'll watch him and he just kind of throws it away a good amount. He doesn't fuck up. He doesn't make big mistakes. The next thing you know, you haven't watched what you thought was an unbelievable performance, but he's in the game with the football in the last 10 minutes and he's going to win. And I think like that type of strategy is so, it's fascinating to, like you said, quantify it because the best players, whether they knew it or not, were, were doing that from a statistically proven standpoint. Yeah, and Scott's been a great friend. I don't endorse anything he puts on Twitter, that's for damn sure. But <laughs> he's uh, he's been a great mentor, and he's taught me a lot. But, yeah, I, it's the same thing like, you know, Jordan in 2015. It was like Jordan in 2015, Jason Day in 2015, Tiger 2000, 2001. They all had similar short side to fat side ratios. So it was like 75, 25 hitting it on the fat side of the hole. Which just shows you it's like, you know, you break that down, you're like, okay, let's 75% is a number. <laughs> like, 
the more we hear about the way you guys approach the, this game and and all the numbers and analytics that go into it, do you think guys like us like oh Bryson DeChambeau like an apology for saying he's the scientist and he's the guy that's like going like you guys are all kind of doing this right like you're all approaching the game in an analytical way it's just like he's super just cringy about it on Instagram and stuff like like I guess you're all just taking the same approach kind of right yeah I mean where it helps us is it helps us learn what we need to practice so it's like if all of a sudden I'm you know, let's say uh, I'm, uh, you know, missing some five to eight footers. And I'm like, you know, this is ridiculous. Like I've got to go practice some five to eight footers. Well, then I go back and look at my stats and all of a sudden my lagging or proxim or what do they call it? Approach putt uh, distance is like just complete garbage. Well, it's like, okay, well maybe you do need to work on some shorter putts, but it's actually your speed is your problem. You're giving yourself so many opportunities and just putting yourself on the eight ball that yeah like this is why you're technically not putting well is actually speed so you're able to like super see exactly what you need to work on and even and, and so that's why like so i've worked with josh gregory and josh gregory he basically three two and it was like two and a half years ago gave me a practice routine and we've stuck to it for a couple years and it's like it checks all the boxes. I mean, short putts, you know, mid length, working on big breakers, lags. But after every tournament, we're able to see specifically what the issue was, and I can maybe put a little more emphasis in one of those certain areas. Man, that's it's also really interesting because I, you know, when you weren't watching Golf Channel during Masters Week, I'm watching Brandel Chambly nonstop, and he's. You know, he goes on a lot about how everybody talks about the greens at Augusta and how you have to putt lights out and how that's just statistically not true. And he talks about, yeah. you know, Bub Bubba Watson historically, who's won twice, who's not a great putter, you know, compared to everybody else out on tour. And that really, if you want to focus on somebody's, like, putting to win the Masters, it's like putting to not fuck it up, right? Like two putting from difficult spots or when you have those 15 footers like not leaving yourself a five foot slider above the hole and actually like ball striking and your iron play getting you in spots where you won't three jack is way more important than putting lights out historically in terms of winning the tournament so it is interesting how you know stats can sort of dispel some of the things that we all take for granted when yeah it comes i mean to like so like Sorry, my little puppy is. Uh, she doesn't like other dogs, but <laughs> we love um, dogs. It's a pro dog show. Yeah, uh, she's the best. She's just uh, she's a little young, <laughs> but um, like sixteen the first day, the pin is on the water line. So like maybe like thirteen and four, let's say, and you basically, if you leave it up on the top shelf, you are going to have ten feet. Like you just it's physically not possible to keep it within 10 feet and so like i was getting uh heckled it's like yeah four three putts and four rounds is what it causes out for us tournament i'm like okay well let's break down my three putts here you've got above the pin on 16 the first day which i hit to 10 i mean it was a terrible shot i hit in the wrong spot uh 10 the final round 50 feet above the hole with 10 feet of break um the guy must have counted one from off the green on uh four which was 75 feet with downhill a ridge that went left and then it actually goes back right about 10 feet or right about six feet for the last 10 feet at the end and then i had another one that um I'm trying to think of which one it was, but like the four three put or the four three putts that I had were literally because I hit it in just absolute atrocious spots. And I mean, I, I, I had, I had actually two putted one on 14 from like a hundred. I mean, it was literally back left pin front, right. And so you can think of all the massive hills in the front. And I literally was like, I have to hit this thing so hard. I might chip this and I might be the one guy that just takes a massive crater out of the green at Augusta and never get invited back. Mm -hmm. And so I hit it as hard as I possibly could. And I didn't even get it up. I mean, literally it was almost going to come back down to my feet, but I had to make like a 35 footer for a two putt. Like, <laughs> and, but it's and, like, I just put myself in the bats, like put myself in bad spots. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you have to do something crazy to, 
to two putt. And it's, it's historically correct that, yeah, I mean, if you break down the run that I had, um, I think it was Friday night or Friday, uh, on the back nine, I one putted my last nine holes. And it's like, if you break down where I was, you're like, I mean, the toughest putt you had was like a 20 footer straight up hill. So, I mean, other than that, I'm like missing it, you know, short sided just off the green and have a super easy chip. So it's just, it's really interesting. Like, even as I was going through it, there's a little luck involved for sure, but I'm like, kind of lucky I missed it there. I mean, you know, just because it's like all these guys, there's so much local knowledge and I've tried to gain as much as I could over the years from playing there. But it's just, you know, when the greens are running 14 and you're basically putting down the sides of hills and whatnot, it's, it's, there's a lot going on. It makes it, it's, it's funny because it makes it interesting and very tricky, I guess I would say from a statistics standpoint, right? Because it'd be very easy for someone to pinpoint that as like oh yeah if sal torres had just putted a little better instead of those three putts he would have he could have won but that's not true like if you would have hit those hit those uh, iron shots wedge shots approach shots a little bit better you wouldn't have been in spots where you could three putt so it's like you can kind of deduce it however you really want to as a statistician but if you know if you actually like watched and know you would understand like you said on 16 like your you have no chance of getting it inside of 10 feet when you're yeah. right on 16. And then from 10 feet, you're less than 50% on the PGA Tour. So really you're like less – your your iron shot puts you in a position where you're less than 50% chance to like to two-putt. Yeah. Yeah, and now I just remember the other – the other one I had was actually on 13. And I had like a 90-yard wedge shot that I hit to like 40 feet. I'm like, you should make six if you're going to hit that bad of a wedge shot. <laughs> like especially after laying up from like two – I think I had like 215, but it was raining and I was just barely in the rough. And I'm like sitting there, I'm laying up with a sand wedge and I'm looking at my caddy. I'm like, can we just like think this through? Like, just give me like a target because I feel like I can just fall asleep here and just hit this in an 80 yard wedge spot with a 55 degree. Like, give me an angle. Like, <laughs> give me something. <laughs> um, did you mess anything up? at Augusta Masters Week, non, like, golf-related, just Augusta-related? Like, did you walk into the wrong spot? Did you say the <laughs> wrong thing? Did, like, um, Yeah, <laughs> you obviously could tell immediately. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I never, I mean, never been in the press room. You know, I, I they did one of those, like, little quick uh, interviews off the, or kind of right by the first tee. And so they say, hey, we're going to take you to the press building on Friday and um, I knew I was going to be in the last group and I was like, cool. And so I, they take me to the press building and it's just, it's incredible. I mean, it is just absolutely, I mean, you're going through tunnels there and oh, it's just the stuff they have in there is amazing. The build out is incredible, but I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I, I've, you know, I've seen the interviews. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen the guys without their hats and seen the background. I have no idea where it is whatever and i just i walk in take my hat off put my phone in, in the little cubby and i'm like cool all right it's ready to go and i literally i just opened the door is about to walk into the end of the press room like no 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 and i'm like uh, uh, I'm sorry I, I you know i've never been here before i'm new to this and he goes we walk in first I'm, yes sir okay oh, what and so well and so they the guy's awesome i mean he, he was super cool about it because he knew i was a rookie and so he was like he's like it's okay like you're, you're new to this and and so he's like he as we're walking through the hallway he said you're gonna sit in the left chair um i'll be on the right and you know we'll probably ask i think he gave me a precise number like it was like seven questions <laughs> and then uh and then it's it'll be uh you know it'll be time to go and i just i was so like awestruck by everything and you know of course like when i open the door it's like no i walk you know we walk in first and, you know sir you know <laughs> sorry you know and the best part about that is it's like you hear all the stories about augusta and um how everyone's always scared about you know walking on eggshells there like they're so nice it's like just ask a question and they don't care but it's like you know you still don't want to you know ruffle any feathers by accident or whatever and you know if if he didn't stop me, I would have just walked right into the press or right into the, you know, chair and just probably sat in the wrong chair. And Hey guys, what's like, going on? Hey, like, what do you want? No, what's going on? <laughs> People yeah. would have shrieked in the background. Yeah. Like, Whoa. Yeah. 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 Just a trap door so, comes out. You just fall yeah, through the floor. Probably, like, probably, yeah. 
I probably would have figured out something was wrong when all the press guys are like looking around at each other like, look at this guy. He's in the final group of the Masters. He can do whatever he wants. Like, look at this arrogant jerk. What are the tunnels like? Uh, Tell us a little bit about the tunnels. We hear so much about them. I want to know just a little bit more about the tunnels. Yeah, so I wish I knew how long it took them to build it, but I want to say it took them literally one off season to do it, um, and they just popped up one year. Um but what I was told, and this is not by any master's officials, but what I was told is that you can fit 18 wheelers in there to bring in merchandise and food, Jesus. which I'm, I'm pretty convinced you could do it. <laughs> um, really? But yeah, it's, yeah. you know, they're air conditioned. They fit in with the, um, the architecture of the club. It's, uh, you know, because I, I mean, I still don't even know where the hell the, the locker room is because you take a tunnel and I don't know which direction it goes. Like if I did not take the tunnel, I don't know where I'm going. I think the locker rooms were left of the range, like way left of the range. But I'm, I yeah, no you just idea. go underground and then when you emerge, you're just at the locker room. Yeah. So when we took. So I would we'd go into player parking, hop on a, a shuttle. They would go left of. Um, they immediately turn left, so you're driving actually towards the clubhouse, and then there's a shuttle, but then it goes down underneath, but it arcs like I think it goes underneath the range at one point, but then underneath the road left of the range, and then it pops up left. So that's why I'm so thrown off is because it's like you do like an underground circle yeah. all the way around. Um, you are talking I mean, like they, you're talking like a guy who was blindfolded. Like they just keep <laughs> you going in different directions where you don't know where you are. It's just, it's so cool, man. <laughs> like, like they, they just do everything just so, I mean, they think of everything. I mean, it's just, you know, like I walk in and every locker room attendant knows the players. Like they know exactly, you know, oh, hi, Mr. Zalatoris. You know, hey, great birdie on 13 yesterday. I'm like, whoa, what? Yeah. whoa. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, do you want to give me some shit about the three butt I had? <laughs> like, but, um, but I'm trying to they it's just off the charts i mean I, i'm trying to think of what else they do there's so just like the cool things of like the little little things here and there but they just they think of everything you said walking on eggshells like don't you like like that right like we all like the idea that you have to walk on eggshells at augusta national it's a place that we just let them be as crazy as possible let them make sure that everything is pristine i can't walk into that room without walking behind a guy in a green jacket yeah. it's the one place that should always stay like that well, and that's the thing. It's like, we love it because of that. Too. Right. Right. Exactly. Like, you know, it's like, it's not me, you know, talking smack about Augusta. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm saying that affectionately. Yeah. Like, right. The traditions of the place. I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, the, um, I, so I, I had heard that when the Eisenhower tree fell, that they gave all the members a piece of the tree. And then they also made a dining room table out of it. The thing I did not realize was all the T markers and all the benches on every hole were from the Eisenhower tree. Jeez. Come on. So there's just stuff like oh, that hey. where it's like, I mean, I, so I've played there, I guess now probably nine or 10 rounds. And it's like every single time I go there, I'm learning something new about the place. And I'm just like, damn, this place is so cool. <laughs> God, yeah. It's like, it's is... like, it's like, it's like you guys just, I would love to sit there in a meeting and just, and I just want to see how it goes. Like I could just see him just going like, all right, well, you know, how are we going to outdo last year? Right. You know, like, I mean. How do they? Oh, yeah. They'll like, find a way. Our first our first year there was 2017, and then we went again in 2018. That was the last time we were there. And I remember between, I believe it was between those two years, in 2018 when we showed up, they just had built a new, like, $7.5 million merch center yeah. that I, that. Trent and I were like, oh, we just missed that last year. Like, yeah. how did we not see that? And people were like, no, that that just didn't exist. And, and now it's there. And yeah. nobody, well, they didn't tell anybody about it. It just appeared. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't been to Augusta, I guess, in four years, maybe five. And they said, at, uh, like, Berkman's Place. Like, I had never even heard of it. And then they're telling me about it. And I'm like, dude, that is, like, six flags on roids for golf. I mean, right. You've got the the simulators, the putting greens, and like Scotty Cameron will, and some of the Scotty guys will come in, and 
and you know fit guys and like all the manufacturers come in and they've got the all you can eat buffet and i heard the tickets this year were going for like 10 grand i'm just like they think of everything i mean the best i still think the best part about that or the best like kind of outside the golf course story is how the free parking used to be like an old neighborhood and they slowly started buying houses and one guy's still holding on to his house yeah, yeah. and it's right by the free parking like <laughs> i think that's i think that's amazing yeah, yeah. Yeah, that guy's just the lone survivor. He's not going anywhere. Yeah, Dude, the place is just—it's so phenomenal. We did a—we did a um, like preview episode where we just talked to a bunch of fans that called in, and that they've been to Augusta, and the amount of people that called in that said that like they risked their lives, and jobs to sneak onto the place at night was absolutely astonishing. I mean, we we only talked to. We only talked to like 10 people, like three of them snuck onto Augusta, took their shoes off, walked around like Amen Corner, like crazy shit. I mean. <laughs> you, you ain't doing that now they got cameras no that's what we yeah, this was back in the early yeah. 2000s late 90s yeah. they said like they did it so yeah we heard there's like 10,000 cam. what's the number of cameras someone said there's just it's like crazy. an absurd I mean, amount of cameras <laughs> i guarantee you every inch of that place they, they've got it covered i mean I, I was even laughing at covid testing like they had little buildings put up just for covid tests <laughs> and i asked i was like are these just for you know covid testing like yeah you know i had to build them in november for november i'm like <laughs> like what happened to the white tents like right. you guys have air conditioned rooms <laughs> right so we, Gus, uh, did you uh did you get any merch did you buy some merch yeah i did um i got a lot um <laughs> I, I didn't go but my parents and fiance went and we got a bunch of stuff i, I mean i i have to be like the biggest snob ever walking around with like a master's coffee cup now it's like you know, if, like I, I, I'm scared to wear the ma the master's face mask because it's like if anyone's gonna if anyone sees me out wearing it, they're like, look at this guy. I mean, my God, he's got one good week, and I was just still living off it. I mean, so I I try to tame it down, but they had some cool stuff this year. They had the um, they had T-shirts that were like for all the sandwiches that that they make. So. Yeah, the, then this is like they're like collectors things where it's like the only the one year you can do it. But I did get the Scotty Cameron Masters Butter too. I know Frankie's um, going to get something Augusta right now. I feel like. Did you yeah. go get something, Frankie? No, the, the something that. Um, no, now we oh, can't, now we just can't hear you. Oh, oh, here we go. Now, now you're on. He's all right. That's the whole thing. No, they're doing the lawn outside, and like I, it was just the guy came right up to the window. I'm like, it's just going to be an issue. So I ran in. I almost ran and got my Masters coffee mug. I got one of those too. That thing's sweet. I got the flag behind me. I mean, that's. Yeah. See, everybody gets. You can merch. spend a lot yeah. of money in, in, on that merch. Oh my god! Oh. Well, I, the the Scotty Cameron collectors putter. Um, I know a bunch of guys collect them, and so I was like, yeah, I'll get one. I mean, hell, I I don't know if I'm ever gonna be back here. I mean, you know, we'll see. <laughs> you never know. So I was like, yeah, I'll get it. And so my coach Troy Denton is like, yeah, they're normally like three hundred bucks. And so I told I told my mom and dad, I was like, yeah, just go go get one, and you know, we could ship it back. And they like put it up on the counter, and it was like seven ninety nine. And my my mom called me. She's like, "You sure you want to do this?" I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah, I mean, why not?" And so like we had a couple friends over there, and it's like, if he's not buying it from you, I'll buy it from you. So it's uh, it's a pretty. I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, the old leather handle where oh, you got to take sure. the take the head off to you have to put it up through the bottom of the shaft and screw the top on. I mean, it's pretty sick. Wow. I mean, it's a no-brainer. That's awesome. Gentlemen, let me ask you a little question. What, uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see me holding a little something like this? Deliciousness. Tasty snack. Best well, golf course snack you can have. This is called Chef's Cut Beef Jerky, and you guys are correct. Everything that you said is correct because this shit, this Chef's Cut Beef Jerky, is the only thing that goes in my bag in terms of snacks. You don't have to. You don't have to worry about like making anything. You don't have to. Worry. You grab this chef cut, which again was come up with, created by caddies. They understand what people want on the golf course. What's a perfect golf snack? The answer is chef's cut real jerky. They got all kinds ASMR. of different flavors too. This is the only thing in my bag that I eat, fellas. Can you hear me taking the plastic off this jerky stick? Listen, listen. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good audio <laughs> what there. About, what about me just <laughs> fighting into it? I'm eating some right now. I mean, that's going to make someone puke. That's all right. That noise is going to make someone legitimately vomit because I was that was a wet chew by me. <laughs> and I apologize, but I cannot control myself when I have chef's cut beef jerky 
in my mouth and in my hand. I mean, the sticks are good. The zero sugar. Yeah. The zero sugar chef's cut packaged beef jerky is so fucking good. And you know you're eating something that's not that bad for you. You know what I mean? It's got no sugar in it. And they have all different types. They got teriyaki. They got regular. They got biltong. You love biltong. Talk to me a little bit about biltong. You love it. Fuck, man. It's protein. It's good, man. It's really Chef's good. Chef's Cut can also <laughs> be found my, I have at my your mouth local, filled with it right now. At your local Kroger. Very important that you check it out at your local Kroger. So if you were wondering, hey, is there where else I can get it? Uh, yep, your local Kroger is the answer. Uh, and then you also can go to Chef's Cut, realjerky.com. Use the code CC4PLAY. That's CC4PLAY. You're going to get 25% off the chef's cut real jerky and meat sticks are available nationwide at your local kroger and also at chef's cut real jerky.com use the code cc4 play one word for 25 percent off smacking that fucking mic with my meat man <laughs> asmr <laughs> shit i want to ask you a question we I, we had a big debate prior to the masters and you know we like to break down every hole and stuff so we i asked the question if you're an amateur golfer right not will zalatoris so you're fucking sick if you're an amateur hack what what would you feel more confident that you could score a better you could, you could have a better score on twelve at Augusta or seventeen at TPC Sawgrass for the average golfer stepping up to that tee? What hole am I making a better score on? Twelve. Thank 12 you, Augusta. Will. Thank you. Seventeen. Like so. Here's the thing about twelve. And as long as I can coach them, <laughs> the thing about twelve is you're aiming at the left edge of that bunker every single time the front bunker like there's just no reason to hit one over there on the right side 17 if you play it back from 130 140 and i'm thinking of this in tournament conditions because yeah. that green was 17 at sawgrass was new this year there was a new green that it, it just planted it or soldered it whatever i mean it was like firm mm -hmm. like i was could a trampoline. not it was a joke i mean the back left pin i'd I landed a 50 degree with the wind off my right at the base of the slope and it skipped up the hill. I mean, it, it was just, it was crazy how firm it was, but 17, I mean, you, you hit a bad, you pull one, you push one, you're in the water. I mean, it, it's that, I think it's that small. If you're like a 10 or 12 handicap, if you play 12 at Augusta, like you can get away with some misses. Like I probably hit about a five handicap tee shot on Sunday at Augusta on 12. I mean, I laid the sod over that thing and it was still dry. Right. right. So, but it's also because I aimed at the right spot, but yeah, 12. For yeah. Sure. I would say like, I was hard on the side of, I, if you put me on either hole, like I think because the green is like cir more circular and bigger on, and a little bit shorter on 17, it's like, I think I could dump a wedge in the middle of that green and two putt more often than I could hit like a nine or an eight iron and actually make a three on 12 at Augusta. But the new green, watching the new green on 17 this year at the players was preposterous. Like, I, I think it was Morikawa who said, he's like, I hit a gap wedge that landed on the front of the green. I couldn't find my ball mark. So, yeah. I mean, you guys, if you guys are hitting wedges, you can't find ball marks. And, like, nobody could two putt to that back right pin or nobody yeah. could get it within, you know, eight feet. It was kind of like 16 at Augusta when you're up top on Sunday. So the new green might change things for me. Yeah, Frankie, I will put a little caveat into this that I think more, more, I, I think more people make par on 12 than, or no, what was I going to say? More people make par on 17, but they make bigger numbers. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's why I kind of worded the question where like, where, what are you more confident that you could score? You could have a better score on, on the T. Like if you're looking out, like what is more appealing to your eye? Something like what you said, where you can just aim into a couple bunkers. You can make a miss. You can, you can push one out, right? You can pull one left and you still dry. If I make a mistake on 17 and like, I don't have it that day, I'm making a 12. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling a Trent and I'm walking back to Iowa. I don't want to play <laughs> golf anymore. Like I'm just not finishing the hole, but I think I can finish the hole on 12 at Augusta. Yeah, I, like that's that's my whole point is it's like even there's guys I mean, someone making 11 there this year uh, uh, at Sawgrass. Yeah, somebody think, made a really high number. Yeah, <laughs> someone made like an 11 there. But it's like any pro, like if, if you just tell them to hit a wedge in the dead middle of the green and move on, like, yeah, it's just just hit in the middle of the green. Like you're going to three-putt it a couple times just because that green's so severe. 
the one time where maybe you hit one and the pin's on the right and it catches the ridge and goes down to six feet, you're like, yeah, I got this. But, you know, 12, I think, for as long as – I mean, 17 is just – it's a big circle. 12, like, you know, the wind shifts a little bit, but I just think that guys – you make more pars on 17, but God, you're going to make a mess of it once you start renting a few. Yeah. I was thinking like if it was, if the challenge was you get to play each of them once and it's like a million dollars, if you can make a par, which hole are you choosing? Like I'm Ooh. taking 17, <laughs> but if it's like you play each of them a hundred times and, and which one will be your lower scoring average, then I'd probably take 12. I think it's close. If you played them at the same distance, I think it's close. Yeah. Um, same distance. But I think it's dicey. Yeah, but I mean, I think it, yeah, like if I had the million dollar challenge, I'm taking 17. Okay. So, All right. but if you need me to make, you know, say if I can't make bogey, I'd probably contemplate playing 12. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, what was the, if, is there one moment where you were the most nervous over a shot or a moment during the Masters this year? Um, I would probably say first tee, either first day or third round. Um, I think it's just because it's like, I'm probably gonna go first tee, first round, actually, because I think it's just, you know, four plays now driving, you know, you just, I've heard that for so many guys, and then all of a sudden they say your name, and it's like, you know, I almost kind of looked over at my caddy and I'm like, it's pretty cool. Like, you know, I kind of wanted to kind of admire it for a second, but I'm like, you still got to hit shot. I mean, still got to show up. But I was laughing because I had like, I had like a 10 footer that was like uphill, but then it was kind of like catching a ridge for birdie on the first. Had a great shot in there. And I had to play two feet of break in it, but it was still like I had to hit it up the hill. And I, I think I left it like two feet short. And I just started laughing at myself. I was just like, you, you pipe the first tee shot at Augusta. You've been dreaming about that one. You hit the dream second shot in there. And then you lay up a 10-footer. Way to go, pal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. if, um, if you're – so a couple of just miscellaneous questions. What is like the farthest carry yardage on, let's say, a par five that you would decide to go for it? Like, what's a what's the number where you're like, okay, I can carry that? Um, yeah, I mean, no wind, dead flat, probably probably three o three o five off the well, like off the t. You're talking off okay. the tee or for the second shot? Either one. Like, it's just interesting. Like, either one. I want, I want to hear that thought process. Like, if you well, got to so carry the off the tee. Yeah, the tee shot's easier to explain because it's like, if I've got enough room side to side, you know, from like tree line to tree line or whatever, and if I've got a bunker that's like 305, like, yeah, I'll hit driver every time. The second shot is where things get a little dicey because, you know, now we're talking about you know, misses and, you know, I, th I mean, I can hit three wood. I mean, if I've got 280, 285, I mean, I can get three wood there, but it's got to be a pretty right scenario to do it. Um, so, I mean, I'd say, I'd probably say 280, 285, the right conditions and kind of like giving me the, the right room to do it. I mean, it's like, you've got holes, like, I guess it's eight it, uh, san antonio where it's like the green is just like this big and there's just no reason to go for it because you just hit on a bunker and you're making i mean you hit in one of the bunkers in the short side you got a tough time just even keeping it on the green playing ping pong but so let's say it's uh let's say it's like par five it's like a um a back right pin it's 278 to cover like water but if you cover water you know you can pretty much get it up and down from anywhere like, are yeah. you comfortable being like, I'm pulling through it and I'm just roasting it over that 270? Yeah, I mean, you're you're talking dream shot there for me. That's like, <laughs> like if you were to ask me exactly what my favorite shot would like, if you had like the one shot that you'd want to hit, it's like three wood, just high bomb right at it, par five, you know, close the curtains, it's over. <laughs> yeah. I, like that's oh, yeah. that's like I've gotten asked that question before. I've given it every single time, and I, yeah, I the whole three wood. We've 18th hole at Dallas National. It's that exact scenario, and 
I I mean I love that shot so much. I, that hole has made me some some nice side coin. <laughs> so you like to just send it with the three wood off the deck? Yeah, I I love I love that. I mean, just hitting a high, just bomb out of the sky, knock it in there tight. That's probably why my par five score was just complete trash, just because I'm like <laughs> You're trying to it. hit something to the moon, and like yeah. in my mind I'm thinking of the tiger twirl. I'm like, oh yeah, this is gonna be funny. Plugs in the bunker, nice six. <laughs> Speaking of the twirl, we, uh, you know, I brought up the the twirl has gotten out of control on tour. It's gotten out of control. When we're watching the Masters and they don't, we can't see exactly where that ball's going. And I'm watching you guys. Maybe not you specifically, but I see a twirl. It better be Tiger esque where that ball's right next to the fucking pin because we're gambling. We're at the we're at the Barstool Sportsbook. Yeah. We're in Philadelphia and we're like, we need a we need a birdie or better on on 13. And we see this guy twirl and it's on the back of the green. We're like, he's not making a fucking he's not making a birdie. What's going? Like, what is happening? I I I need to hear about what goes into your mind when you when you do the twirl like like is it immediate right after contact are you making sure that things right next to the stick talk to me through it so here's the best <laughs> i'm here free on the twirl thing because this the, you'll love this answer if you go back and look at me hitting shots i i can't twirl the golf club like <laughs> it's like uh, there's one shot on 18 and i think it was either the second or third round and like my version of a twirl is literally just the club like I just grab it like I like kind of drops in my hands and I'm like frozen like when I twirl it there's like a 98% chance that club's coming out of my hands and I look like I've never done it before <laughs> so I'm here for you on the twirl part I'm I will counterbalance all the uh, all right, tour good. twirling that's going on it's, but it's gotten out of hand man it's like yeah it's I, just... the other part with me too the other part with me is like anytime I have tried to twirl I've normally like air mail to green or <laughs> you know it's like it's just never worked out well Dude, so I'm just is... like what it's a swaggy so. p he, he 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 hits the he goes for the three he turns around to the camera and it just banks off the fucking rim it never went yeah. in it's like you can't celebrate before that ball hits the ground you can't yeah tiger tiger's president's cup parting park oh. club twirl walk is just the i mean it's the nastiest thing i've ever seen <laughs> just it full just, extension he's got full extension i oh. mean just just <laughs> sick just sickening I, I remember trying to do that like a month or two later because i was playing in a <laughs> east versus west match for ajga and i like i remember doing it on 18 and i like hit it and i went to like 40 feet and i'm like yeah that was nice like yeah it feels good feels good but execution's not there um so what's next where are we at where are we at next how's our how's our outlook looking yeah i got a lot of golf coming up um i'm gonna go get a do a quick trip to Kiowa, go check it out. Uh, I never played there before. Uh, I got, I'm going to play a lot actually. I'm going to play six out of seven coming up. Um, so it'll be a busy stretch. I mean, it'll be fun though. Cause I got two weeks at home. So that's like, you know, you get out and I've been asked before. It's like, man, you know, you sure you want to take a week off. I'm like, what those two weeks at home, like, what am I going to do while I'm at home? I'm going to go play a game with my buddies. So it's like, you know, I'll go play five in a row like this. Like I played seven to start this year and I'm not doing that again unless I have to. Um, but really, it sounds like it might go over Scottish and British and, um, you know, yeah. we'll kind of see what happens from here. I mean, you know, obviously you got to win one to get into the FedEx Cup playoffs. So obviously I need to put more attention here for now. Um, so sweet. We'll see. Hell yeah. Well, dude, it was, um, it was, well, real I can quick, tell... real quick, we, I, and you, you got all the Adam Sandler caddy stuff. I'm sure you've been heard, heard about it for a fucking month now. But we actually talked to the real caddy from the movie. I don't know if you saw that. This guy, Jared, yeah, I did. Jared yeah. von Snellenberg. And he's a brain researcher. I mean, you guys could. I saw it's, that. it's one of the funniest storylines of all time. That <laughs> this guy's so... just like studying brains. I, I hope we're actually going to go and get my brain checked out one of these days. But um, it is funny just like that comparison and where that guy's sitting in like a school school somewhere just watching everyone call you him. I thought that was just a funny little thing. I've, I've had it for like five years too. That's right. the best part. Yeah. <laughs> So it, that 60 degree just got retired. I had to give the, uh, because I had the Mr. Gilmore Mercati, I had to honor uh, Butch. So he looks like a one iron without a grip on it. So that's on the 60 right now. But there's going to be more comparisons. It'll, it'll keep on rolling. Yep. Oh, yeah. No doubt. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's some traction there. There's no doubt. Totally. <laughs> 
Uh, well, look, we appreciate it. it. Was it was insanely fun to watch the Masters? I can tell the way that you talk through it, the way that you remember every single shot that it's still burning a little bit. There's still some unfinished business with you and Augusta National, so I, I like that a lot. And uh, and good luck out there. We appreciate the time. No, oh, thanks for having me, boys. It was a lot of fun. Look forward to meeting you guys in person. Yeah, man. And oh, you're yeah. like you're like my uh, slender king. We both have like the same frame. So keep keep <laughs> slaying it out there, man. You're like we needed one of the, we needed a guy out there on tour. You got all these big beefy like Brooks kept well, goes all. He's actually well, it's like, I was gonna say yeah, well, I don't relax. think you can you can't you can't claim skin <laughs> yes. anymore. You got more dough on your body now. No, relax. Listen, we both got the whole we got the slender look to us. So when I see him out there, it's like, hey, one of us is doing it. <laughs> oh. I'm here for you, Frankie. Thanks, bro. I appreciate <laughs> we it. Appreciate you know, we're looking time, forward man. to seeing you at a tournament, man. Yeah, you're 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 an up and coming superstar, and we're uh, very excited to have you on the show. And thanks for the time, man. Yeah. Uh, thanks, boys. Thanks, Will. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. We'll see you.